morning subscribers, it's the 6th of June, big day for you all, A-level economist doing your microeconomics paper this afternoon. I wish you the best of luck and I hope that the G-economics micro predictions come up trumps this afternoon, time will tell. So in this particular video I'm now going to run through a few areas of perhaps potentially more likely assessment for the macroeconomics paper which of course is next week. So let's get to it and let's just have a look at the areas of the specification which are obviously uh, going to be assessed for the macroeconomics course. So here we have them all as you can see um, and this will, be, this will be nothing new to you all really so I'll not say too much about it. However you can see here that we have five key areas on the specification. Economic policy objectives and indicators of macroeconomic performance. AD and AS, aggregate demand, aggregate supply. Government policy, global context, and then this new sector, uh, new for the current A-level specification, with regard to the financial sector. So, in the same way as I did for the micro paper, let's have a look and see which areas have been targeted the most when it comes to essays for the macroeconomics paper. So, let's scroll down, ladies and gentlemen, until we get to this. So, areas assessed to date by way of essays are shown in red. Now, of course, when I say assessed to date, I mean either on the specimen assessment materials which are on the website or the additional SAMS papers which your teachers I'm sure have passed on to you uh, from the OCR interchange. Um, if you're struggling to find any of those then there is a link in one of my previous videos to a whole series, it's called Economics Revision Resources I believe and there's a, a series of links there and you'll be able to pick up all of those sample assessment materials should you wish to have a, a little look through them and a peruse of them. So, essays are in red. Economic policy objectives and indicators of macro performance. So, economic growth and economic development. So we've had one essay and that was to do with the World Trade Organization. Now, as I said to my students, that in your textbook is a very small section of the textbook maybe one, one and a half pages at the absolute most. And therefore, unless you've covered this in quite some detail, that, in my view, would be an essay which you would be steering away from. Remember, essay choice in these papers, you get a choice of one from two and then another one from two. So, essay choice is very important. If it was me, I would not be touching that with a barge pole because the likely depth that you'll have gone into it for an exam is probably not sufficient if you've just simply stuck to what's in the textbook. Okay, next one. There was a previous essay on the changing pattern of employment. Not a bad one. Um, and then another one on inflation which was to do with QTM. And by QTM I mean of course the quantity theory of money, the Fisher equation, MV equals PT, increased money supply leads to increased price level and all that jazz. So those are the three essays that have been uh, targeted at that area of the specification in the sample assessment materials. Okay, next one, AD and AS. Lovely essay on one of the previous papers, all to do with the shape of the AS curve. So the Keynesian long run aggregates, as you all know, shaped like so, or the classical perfectly inelastic curve, and just requiring an explanation and consideration as to which of those, number one is most realistic, and uh, number two, how, how, how it comes to be that one is this sort of backwards L shape and the other one is the perfectly inelastic curve. Lovely essay, that one. And then this one here, again, it relates to the one I talked about previously, where we talked about the quantity theory of money um, and just this whole notion of as you move beyond the Phillips curve, you come to the perfectly inelastic section of the curve where any further changes in AD simply lead to rising price levels. And so that was worth tying in with um, a discussion of sort of Keynesian versus classical views. Okay, next part then we're on to policy, government policy, fiscal monetary supply side policy conflicts. Now you can see we've got quite a lot in this area. 
So fiscal policy, there was an essay about whether or not it would be good for the, I believe the question was something along the lines of, would it be good for a country's economic growth to increase the top rate of tax? Nice question. There was one on, would reducing the base rate lead to reduction in the exchange rate? So is it necessarily the case, we always do say this in theory, that the reduction in the base rate would lead to an outflow of hot money and as a consequence the supply of sterling, if it was sterling, would increase and that would lead to your downward depreciation of the value of sterling, but would that always necessarily be the case? So you've got to think as to reasons why that might not be the case. It was a great little essay that one, so nice one that one. Policy conflicts, growth and inflation. Lovely one that one. That would be an, that's a dream one, isn't it? So your trade-off on the Phillips curve and all that discussion about capacity, spare capacity, getting close to full capacity, bottlenecks in the economy, etc. Great essay that one. And then Next one, the shape of the long run aggregate. Again, similar to one previously, uh, where it talked about the shape of the Keynesian aggregate supply curve. So that's been targeted quite a lot. But there are many other ways in which it still could be targeted, so don't rule that out by any means. Then we move on to globalisation. Globalisation and income inequality in developed nations. Not developing nations, developed nations. So as we approach the election, of course, this is something that's quite topical about income distribution and equality and inequality. Nice essay, that one. Comparative advantage, so sort of talking through the whole theory of comparative advantage and then evaluating and pointing out the weaknesses of it. Again, nice essay. And then on trade and negotiations, there was one on what are the benefits to the UK of having an EU membership, how ironic. And then another one on World Trade Organization. So that relates, that actually is the same one which I mentioned at the top. It's the same essay. So again, uh, quite, number one, uh, quite topical this one. So that would probably be something that you could tackle and handle very well. And then finally, the role of the central bank. So this is in the financial sector. So should the Bank of England, the essay was something along the lines of should the Bank of England act as the lender of last resort? Yay or nay? And then there was nothing further on that. So those, ladies and gentlemen, those are the essays that have been and gone on the sample assessment materials. And therefore it would be pretty unlikely that you're going to see any of those again, certainly in that word format anyway. So let's have a look and consider some essays which might be more likely to appear on your papers. Now I'm just making a, a sort of a, a guesstimation here as to topic areas which I think might come up. So what about this one? Evaluate the effectiveness of international organisations such as the IMF and the World Bank. We've already had an essay on the WTO so it's not unreasonable to think that we could get an essay perhaps on the IMF or the World Bank. Now, again, if it were me, that would be one that I would be veering away from simply because of the level of depth and detail in your textbook. But if you've gone into that in more detail, then that's maybe something that you could handle well and you might feel comfortable with that. What about one on evaluate the effects of full employment? We see quite often um, essays about unemployment, but the, the exam board, now they've got a tendency of just flicking the old curve ball in there. So as we in the UK and also our colleagues and friends in the United States, as our unemployment levels fall and we're moving towards this notion of full employment, remember full employment of course is not 0% uh, unemployment, so as we move in the UK as we're nudging towards that 4% line really, um, we're getting towards full employment and so maybe you might be asked to consider what are the the pitfalls of that and what, of course, are the advantages of that. be a nice essay, that one, I think. Evaluate the causes and consequences of deflation. Now, I threw this one in because, again, inflation, it's assessed all the time. Deflation is not assessed all the time. However, that really is the statement lifted directly out of your specification. So that certainly is an area which I would be looking at. Deflation. How is it caused? sort of key causes and then what are the key consequences who are the winners and who are the losers 
because it's not the case that everybody is a winner in terms of deflation. And then what about what an income distribution? The causes and consequences of poverty and inequality. Now we've already had one on uh, global, that sort of uh, global distribution of income and wealth in developed nations, but what about one on the causes and consequences of poverty? And again, you know, looking into specification, and you're looking for the solutions to that in the form of minimum wage, living wage, uh, reforms to the tax system, all this type of thing. Lovely essay, that. And so, ladies and gentlemen, as you watch this, maybe you think to yourself um, uh, in the first instance, oh, well, I'm not really sure I could do that, but I'm sure if you just sat for five minutes, you could jot down a list of sort of discussion points that you could used to formulate a very, very good essay. So, you know, believe and uh, have confidence in yourselves at this point in the course. You, you know, you probably know the most A-level economics that you'll ever know at the moment. Next section then, what about evaluate whether the Phillips curve accurately explains the relationship between inflation and unemployment. Lovely essay that would be, lifted directly from the spec. Nice one. Evaluate the consequences of an output gap. Now, make sure that you're able to handle both the negative output gap, which is just talked about and discussed all the time, unemployment, uh, perhaps disinflation in the economy, all that type of thing, but also the positive output gap. So the, the demand pull pressures, the inflationary pressures, uh, producing beyond your potential for a short period of time, make sure that you're able to cope, handle, uh, draw, illustrate and explain all of that. Evaluate the policies to correct a budget deficit. That's, it seems like such a straightforward answer, that one. Um, and you've only got to think and, and consider the, the Labour Party view and the Conservative Party view on this. So Conservatives into the austerity, bringing that budget deficit down significantly over the years. Um, but of course, as you cut your spending, that's a contractionary uh, policy really, whereas the Labour Party would say, well, let's spend a bit more, let's borrow a bit more, get the economy growing. Once we're growing, we'll bring in more tax revenue, and that will enable us to bring down the deficit. So, two conflicting views there. And then lastly, the effectiveness of fiscal rules, ladies and gentlemen. Now, in his recent um, budget statement, the Chancellor, Philip Hammond, put out... Um, a new fiscal rule with regard to the budget surplus and when we're going to achieve a budget surplus, putting that back from 2020 back into sort of 2024, 2025. So do have a look at fiscal rules. I think that's very important to know what fiscal rules are. These are obviously the rules to do with uh, the government borrowing and spending plans, but they are a bit of a movable feast and they do tend to shift around and change from uh, one parliament to the next. And if you, if you are interested, there's a, if you go on the Financial Times website, type in fiscal rules, you get some good articles on Philip Hammond and what he said about that. What about an essay on the evaluate the effectiveness of monetary policy to achieve the government's main macro objectives? So, uh, monetary policy, we're thinking obviously money supply, interest rate, etc. I think the key thing here is that whatever the question is, if it talks about to achieve the macro objectives, make sure that you then discuss how effective they would be in achieving un low unemployment, economic growth, favourable trade balance, um, low and stable inflation. Discuss them all. Supply side policy. Now, there's been no previous direct questions on this, so maybe that really is a very, a very, very likely area of assessment. Inflation and the balance of payments. So this is to do with the policy conflicts. You'll remember that the previous one was to do with growth and inflation. Well, what about one on inflation and trade balance problems or growth and trade balance problems? What about one uh, an essay on multinational corporations and employment? That would be a lovely essay. All your reading of Joseph Stiglitz would really help you in that. With regard to international trade, um, what, we've had one on comparative advantage. What about international trade and development? How beneficial is it for developing nations to engage in international trade? 
Do they benefit from it? What are the problems that they incur and encounter? Evaluate the extent to which a significant trade deficit is good or bad. That would be a lovely policy, that essay. And policies to correct a trade deficit or surplus. That would be a nice essay as well. Uh, possibly too easy maybe for A-level, but we'll see. Evaluate the effectiveness of changing the value of a currency to achieve macro policy objectives. Now, this one on exchange rates, I'm going to put up shortly, even later today, um, an article which was in the Sunday Times, not Sunday past, but the previous Sunday, and it talks about the fact that the UK's 15% depreciation in sterling has been the least effective depreciation for about 60 years. Um, and obviously those of you who are au fait with your exchange rates and Marshall Lerner, and the way in which the Marshall Lerner condition should kick in, in theory, as a consequence of a depreciation, that hasn't actually happened this time. And then we haven't had any essays at all on protectionism. Now, this whole notion of protectionism, um, your trade diagrams, trade creation, trade diversion, etc., I think those are lovely diagrams to know and to learn and to be able to analyse. And obviously, that's where they would be brought in, so do look out for an essay on that. And then we move into this last section, the sort of the, the big unknown, as it were. We really don't know how things are going to pan out on the financial sector. Will you get a question saying, evaluate the relevance of the quantity theory of money? That would be a lovely essay, wouldn't it? Because, of course, we've had 435 billion of new quantitative easing money dropped into the economy. Has it led to rampant inflation? No, it hasn't. So you could discuss the theory and then discuss realities. It would be a great essay, that one. Evaluate the role of microfinance. Again, if it were me, that's one I would steer clear of because it's such a small element of your textbook. But you might not have an alternative. Evaluate the impact on and importance of remittances. Ladies and gentlemen, go to the F585 paper, June 2016. Look at the mark scheme. There is a mark scheme written for that very question because it was on the old legacy paper last year. Evaluate the role of an independent bank acting as the lender of the last resort. That's a great question, isn't it? So, um, should, for example, the independent bank, should it, uh, or what are the benefits of having the independent bank? You'll know that the Labour government, elected in 97, one of the first things that they did was to make the central bank independent from political decision making. So that its key role was to look at, some, look at managing the economy. And of course there are advantages and disadvantages that come with that, and that would be a great essay to get on it. And then evaluate an independent versus a control one. It's sort of the same type of question as, you know, uh, should it be politicians who are uh, doing the fiscal and the monetary policy together, or should they be um, siphoned off? Okay, so that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to this little link here. Uh, so if you go onto the AQA website and <clears throat> you look for A-level resources on financial markets and monetary policy, you get a lot there to help you with these styles of question. And then financial regulation, essay. Evaluate the importance of regulation within an economy of the financial system. What a great essay that would be in light of the financial crash in light of our talk uh, from Lucy Armstrong. Uh, there's a video to that, of course, ladies and gentlemen. So that would be like another great essay to get. So I think those are all potential essay questions. What about data questions? Well, so far, the data questions have been focused on economic development, unemployment. No, that's wrong, ladies and gentlemen. These are what I think the potential areas could be. The, the areas which have been targeted so far include, I think they're in orange, yes. So the multiplier, the twin deficits, so by that we mean the fiscal deficit and the trade deficit. Monetary policy, the transmission mechanism, liquidity trap and terms of trade. Supply side policies and investment. And again, something here on twin deficits. And I think 
a little bit here on the money supply and the impact on the price level, but that's about it. So, when we think about data questions, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to think to ourselves, where could we have sort of a nice bit of text, bit of numbers uh, for you to analyze? So, these are the areas I think that you might get a data question. Something maybe on economic development. Something on unemployment. Something to do with inflation, because then you've got the whole notion of index numbers, inflation, deflation, disinflation, and your interpretation of charts, etc. So that's a potential area, I think. The Phillips curve, because you could be given some data on unemployment and inflation and asked to analyze and interpret that. You might get something on policy conflicts because, you again, data is easy to come by and easy to fit into some sort of structure for that type of data question. As is globalization data. Exchange rates. I, I say exchange rates potentially because candidates very often uh, don't get the interpretation of exchange rates diagrams correct and they uh, are mis- they misinterpret data with regard to what currencies are appreciating and depreciating, especially when it's shown in a graphical format, as was the case on the AS paper, for example. And then finally, maybe something on uh, the Bank of England, the fin financial sector. Difficult to say really on the financial sector at this point, when it's, this is as much a learning process for your teachers as it is for you, so we'll just have to see really how this pans out in the financial sector. But it's certainly not an area which has been targeted heavily on the sample assessment materials. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to leave it at that. Very best wishes for the exams as ever. Bye for now.